All right, everybody. Well, it is the top of the hour. And so I want to get uh, go ahead and get started with tonight's presentation. Um, for those of you joining us, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for investing your time in learning about this uh, incredibly important topic when it comes to students helping help and pay for school. Um, tonight, we have a we have a wonderful presentation put together for you in regards to some panelists that can talk to you about some of the services and resources that Montana State University has to provide. And as many of you across the country have heard, there's some major changes coming to the FAFSA process, the free application for federal student aid. And from, from the perspective of some professionals who work with FAFSA and who work with students and in the process of paying for school every single day, you're gonna hear as much as we know at this point about what that new FAFSA process is gonna look like. We're gonna detail some, some dates and some deadlines and some kind of technical pieces, uh, just to make sure that we have as much information in your hands as humanly possible. So, so to get started this evening, uh, I wanna start with some technical information about tonight's presentation. Um, so with tonight's presentation, if you don't hear anything coming through your speakers right now, we encourage you to call in. Um, you can see that there's two phone numbers there on the on that um, slide on the on your screens. There's a toll free number and there's a toll number in which you can call into tonight's presentation if you're not hearing anything coming through your speakers at this point. The access code there is provided. And so if you just call into that number and provide that access code, you'll be logged right in and you can follow along on your screens and hear what everybody is having to say. Um, one of the, the questions that has already come into the chat feature, which we encourage you all to use throughout the evening tonight, is, is this going to be recorded? Can I catch a recording of tonight's presentation later on if you have to leave early or if, you know, some folks who, who actually registered aren't able to make it? We record every single one of our webinars. And so, uh, no different this evening. We're going to be recording tonight's webinar session and we'll be posting it to our webinar Wednesday homepage, which just got thrown into the chat. Thank you, Anna, for doing that. Um, and that is where you can watch tonight's recording and recordings of any of our previous webinar Wednesday offerings that we've had so far this fall. And so we do hope that you'll keep in touch. We've hosted webinar Wednesdays for first generation students, for living on campus, for MSU basics, and much more throughout this fall semester. And so if there's anything that you missed or anything that you're looking to catch up on, um, visit that site that Anna put in the chat and we'll be more than happy to get you filled in. Um, I keep mentioning Anna and putting things in the chat. As I mentioned, uh, we do hope that you all will engage in tonight's uh, webinar kind of in an interpersonal fashion. So we have a chat feature that's available tonight. We also have a Q&A feature. The Q&A feature tends to work better in terms of asking and receiving answers to specific questions. Um, we have staff members on hand from our Office of Financial Aid. We have staff members on hand from our Office of Admissions, and we are here to help kind of navigate tonight's information for you. And so if you have a question, use that Q&A feature. Uh, one of our staff members is on, who is on hand will be more than happy to help answer. We can provide links. We can help you get pointed in the right direction. But please don't be a stranger. Don't be shy tonight. Um, tonight is all about you all who are giving us your time. And we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to answer as many of those questions that are coming in as humanly possible. So whether it's through the chat feature or through the Q&A, whatever works best for you. But please don't be shy in asking those questions. So as for who I am, you can see on the screen right there. Uh, my name is Anders Groseth, and I work as the Associate Director for Recruitment here in the Office of Admissions at Montana State University. I am a proud MSU alum. I graduated from Montana State University in 2008. I'm also a Bozeman native. Um, I grew up about four blocks from our campus, kind of growing up in the shadow of the campus and the university. Had a wonderful four years here as an undergraduate student before uh, taking the leap and starting to work in college admissions right after I graduated. So this summer I, I celebrated my 15th year working at Montana State University. Um, and so it's been, a, it's been a wonderful ride. MSU, for many of you, this is uh, what our president always says, the welcome to your university. And that is truly the case. This is a place that will support you. And you're going to hear about some of those support services tonight on the financial side of things. But whether it's an academic, um, whether it's an academic component, a uh, transitional component, student engagement, you're going to find that Montana State University has people, faculty and staff and your peers and classmates that are going to really harness and support your academic and, and university pursuits throughout your four years here. So, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, you're not going to hear too much from me tonight. Who, are, who you are going to hear from is some of our real professionals. So 
as you just saw there, tonight's agenda. We are gonna cover some of these new aspects of the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA. And so we're gonna really dive into that. Some of what's changed about it, sort of possibly even some of the purpose behind some of the change of the, of the new FAFSA. We're gonna cover all of our scholarship information. That's what MSU can do to help you pay for school is to reward you for the hard work that you've put in throughout your high school career to be the student that you are. So we'll be taking some time to detail both in-state and out-of-state scholarship programs. And then we're gonna get into those services that MSU offers students and families. And so we're gonna kind of cover a lot of information. We have about an hour with you this evening, um, but we are, we're gonna be here for as long as, as the questions come in. And at the end of the presentation this evening, we're gonna leave time to do a live Q&A. Um, many of you, when you registered for this, uh, for this webinar this evening, you provided us with questions on your registration form, wanting to know more about scholarships or more about payment plans or how to find work on campus, whatever the case might be. We're going to monitor the chat and the Q&A feature throughout the evening. We're going to handpick some questions that are kind of thematic that keep coming up throughout the evening, and we're going to answer some of those questions that came in on your registration forms as well. So that's a little bit about kind of the outline of the evening. But the real stars of your show tonight are going to be your two hosts. Who we have this evening is our Director of Financial Aid, James Broshite, and MSU's Senior Financial Coach, Keith Hamburg. Now, James obviously works in the Office of Financial Aid, and the Office of Financial Education is where Keith works, and that's a, that's a branch of our, the Alan Yarnell Center for Student Success. Now, this is an extra service that Montana State University offers. A financial aid and financial education are not the same office, but they really work hand in hand in terms of identifying funding opportunities and helping to identify funding opportunities for students that, that can help them in the process of paying for school and financing their education. And so these are going to be your two pros this evening that will kind of walk through the majority of the evening and then I'll hop back on to, to navigate that Q&A at the end of tonight's session as well. So. Uh, with that, I am going to hand it over to James Broshite, who is our Director of Financial Aid. We're going to start by talking about some of those scholarship opportunities and then get into kind of the nitty gritty of the new FAFSA and move forward from there. So, again, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for logging in. And with that, I'm going to hand it off. James, thank you for being here. Thank you, Anders. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to assume everything's coming through on the mic just fine. Um, unless I hear otherwise, uh, but good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you and to share some. Uh, information that we have with you, uh, try to answer some questions, alleviate some concerns and do those kinds of things. Uh, financial aid and, and this whole financial aspect of the whole process is is an ongoing thing. So what, what you is tonight is really just a start of giving you some information, you know, giving you some knowledge, giving you some background on some different things and then journey then last your entire educational career. So we're just kind of beginning what that relationship looks like and where we go with that. But um, as Andrew said, there's this uh, reward uh, for for your high school uh, you know, academics and your high school achievements and what they have. And so in that we have scholarship opportunities, opportunities for both in-state and out-of-state students. Uh, for our in-state students, we have uh, the Premier Scholarship. And if you've already been admitted, uh, you may have already gotten a letter uh, with my signature on it that uh, talks to you about the Premier Scholarship uh, or the Achievement Scholarship for a non-resident. So those may already be out there in terms of what you're looking at. Um, additionally, for in-state, uh, there's a Hillman Scholarship Program, and I'm going to save the details for that for Keith. He's got a slide on that toward the end of the presentation, and he will talk a little bit more about the, the benefits of the Hillman Scholarship Program for our in-state uh, students. And if you're also in-state, uh, the Montana University System that we call MUS has an Honors Scholarship Program, and if you aren't aware of that through your high school, uh, you want to check that out. Um, you want to go to the MUS, and you can just search MUS Honors Scholarship Program, really in any search engine, you're going to come up with it. Uh, but that's an application with a deadline. Uh, you have to apply for that and then be awarded that, but that's going to be based on your high school credentials as well in terms of what that looks like. Uh, Out-of-state students, uh, because of just the different way that we do different things, we have an achievement scholarship that we call for, for uh, our out-of-state students. So again, if you have been admitted, you may have already seen a letter from me uh, offering you an amount of an achievement scholarship to go with that. And there's a range of dollars that go with that based on your uh, reported GPA that you gave to us. Uh, depending on that GPA, you may have also received a, a letter and invitation from admissions 
inviting you to apply for the WUI Award. Uh, that is a Western undergraduate um, award. Um, it, it's not something specific to Montana State, but it is something competitively specific to Montana State. Uh, we have such uh, good uh, credentials really with the WUI program and with the amount of students that we have uh, with that, that it's become a competitive award for us. And that's quite different than our competitors and other uh, institutions you might be looking at who award that automatically to many out-of-state students from the WUI states. Um, but for us at Montana State, it is a competitive award, which requires an application for you, and you would have received a letter directing you to our CAT scholarships database to put some profile information in, and the WUI opportunity should show up for you because of the GPA that you have or minimum GPA based on that invitation to apply for that WUI award. So. Uh, that might generate some questions, um, and hopefully if you throw those in the chat or something else, you can get those kind of answered a little bit more specifically. But uh, the biggest point there is that for Montana State, this is a competitive award. It's the highest profile award that we offer for our non-residents. So take a look at that, um, depending on what your GPA is. That is a 3.0 minimum, and then you should have gotten an invitation to do that. Then we have a box down here for just all students. So. Montana State, like uh, um, many schools, we ha have college or departmental scholarships. Uh, those are mostly done through our CAT scholarship portal, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, as we kind of go to go through. But you're going to hear CAT scholarships mentioned in terms of kind of where you go and how you kind of apply for institutional based scholarships. And then you have outside scholarships. Those are going to come from uh, parent organizations, student organizations that you may have applied from or that you're hearing different things from. Those can be rotary, those can be tied to your work, it can be tied to a parent work. They can be tied to all kinds of different opportunities that you have to bring in outside money to help you pay for your educational expenses. Um, lastly, there we have the Honors College Presidential Scholarship. Uh, that's, uh, again, one another high award that uh, Montana State offers, uh, also competitive through application. Um, and you can kind of find out where those pieces are by kind of just getting in touch with some aspects of what that does. But uh, if you get a presidential, that is a higher award than, than likely the achievement or the WUI. And in any combination of things, you, we give you the highest tuition award that we can with any one of these scholarship opportunities. So stay tuned for what those look like as we kind of go through a little bit more. So you're hearing, seeing a little bit that I should have probably moved to this one a little earlier, but you're seeing the value of the premier awards from one to 4,000 um, and based on the GPA. I think the thing to note here, these are renewable awards based on your academic progress. Uh, so, and they apply only to tuition costs. So there'll be a question I'm sure that comes up on how to do that, but these awards apply only to tuition. So if you have other awards that are tuition based only, they become kind of this combination type of activity where until we meet the full cost of tuition, these things can apply to that. If this meets only part of that, uh, 1,000 meets tuition, and it would go the same for achievement here in a minute, then other awards that are tuition only can be met up until that value of tuition is actually met. Um, again, I'm going to save uh, the Hillman program for Keith a little bit later, uh, but here again, you're seeing some of the, the MUS. Uh, that application is due by March 15th uh, into the Montana University System Office. And then they kind of uh, go through those and they tell campuses uh, what students are receiving those benefits. And then they come to us directly from the state in order to get those. And uh, what wasn't showing on the other uh, screen is uh, Montana's Treasure State Scholarship or Award. That is for first generation college students. And you get offered that based on uh, your admissions application question. Um, you won't see that on your award for a little bit. We, we accumulate those as we kind of go through uh, time and then we get those on once we start awarding uh, files, which would be later in March and toward the end of the spring, uh, you would be likely for you to see that. So unlike the premiere or the achievement, you won't see those kind of right away on, as you navigate kind of what's there. But uh, that is an automatic award based on how you answer the question on your uh, admissions application. Spend a little time already talking about the achievement and the WUI, but here we're gonna talk about, the. you can see that the ranges for the achievement based on that GPA or anywhere from 6,000 to 15,000 a year. Uh, the WUI has more value than that, uh, but again, it's by competitive nature only, and the two do not combine with one another by what they're there. You get the best one that we can offer you based on what's there. Um, the renewability, as we talk about uh, both the Premier 
achievement in the WUI Awards and for many other opportunities that you have on campus exist with some level of renewability, which means you have academic performance that you need to maintain. Um, the minimum GPA for most of these things are going to be 2.5, and they require 30 credits of attempted 30 credits annually to maintain these awards. Uh, if you've seen your letters and you read through a little bit of the detail on those letters, those offers are for four years. In order for you to complete a degree in four years, you need to do 30 credits a year. So uh, if you don't do that, there's an appeal process for all these different types of things, but the awards will run out after eight semesters or four years of use of those kinds of activities. So we want you to kind of be conscientious about that, plan ahead, work accordingly, and get the help where you need them on the academic side of the house. But 2.5 and 30 credits a year is what it takes to renew those activities measured at the end of the spring term. Uh, for other ones, again, we talked, I mentioned the CAT scholarships earlier, but about 80 to 90 percent of our college or departmental scholarships are awarded through foundation awards, and we use an, a, a portal for that called CAT scholarships. And that one application gets you qualified for what those, all those different opportunities that exist. So that one application, put in your profile, um, document kind of some of your experiences and where you go, you get a chance to put some narrative in there. And you want to do that and, and spend some time on that CAT scholarship application and provide as much detail about yourself as you can, um, being humbly kind of a bragging kind of way, because um, people who review those, uh, those awards are looking to get as much information about you, and they're competitive. So they're comparing you with a bunch of uh, uh, many other students who use the CAT scholarships portal and end up in a pool of an opportunity to be able to kind of go through that. And they're Colleges or departments own those awards, and they have committees that go through and read those applications and go through and then make the awards for those. And um, the big thing there is it's always important for you to apply. There's, I'll say, you know, it's competitive in nature, just like the WUI. So it's competitive dollars that go out. So, but just because you didn't get something initially doesn't mean you might not end up with something later. So it's an annual application that needs to be done. It opens in November every year. Uh, the priority deadline is February 1st of every year so that departments can start making awards for the next school year uh, sometime after March or so of that school year. Um, outside scholarships, again, those uh, Keith can talk about those when he gets to some of his stuff, but uh, we combine with uh, Keith in financial education to do a number of uh, workshops every semester that kind of help facilitate your use of outside scholarships if you don't already have a handle on what those looks like. But you can bring as many of those external awards with you as you can. Those are great. Sometimes those are one year only kind of awards that you bring in as a freshman. So it's important for you to kind of still navigate that field a little bit, even after your freshman year to try to find other opportunities and different things that exist there. Um, mentioned the presidential award. That is the most prestigious academic award we have. Uh, so again, you get full tuition waiver and a housing stipend. And so the presidential scholarship becomes that most valued award uh, but it is a different application and, again, competitive because it's read by uh, several different um, reviewers, and then they will decide on who gets those presidential awards. So look for that as an opportunity uh, based on your qualifications there as well. Where can you see a bunch of these different things? You can see them in your, your My Info account, and you're going to hear when we talk about forms that might be needed, when we talk about viewing different things, uh, both related to your bill, to your financial aid, to your academics. Your My Info account is where a lot of this uh, information lives. Your admissions checklist, all these different things. Look, you can see your view in your My Info. And when we have awards up and viewable, you will see those uh, in your My Info in the, the financial aid section as well. Uh, for 24-25, that is delayed as well as the FAFSA is being delayed a little bit. So those are not viewable just yet. If you've uh, had an acceptance offer that you've submitted, um, I feel really confident that it's probably here. We just haven't, don't have a vehicle yet for showing you that they're there. Um, so stay tuned for that, but feel free to give us a call if you're not sure. But right now, don't panic on that if you've sent something in and, and are in your my info because we just haven't had the process or the ability to get them into my info yet so that you can see that they've actually exist. So be patient with that. We're working on getting that done uh, with some updates just as soon as we can figure out a way to do that. So managing your financial aid. Um, I'm continuing with this section 
And what I want to do is kind of thank you for your, your interest in higher education. Uh, this is an investment in yourself. This is an investment in your future earnings and everything that it takes to kind of go along with that. And it costs money to do that. So the money that you pay to gain this kind of academic achievement in college and do these different things is part of that investment. So uh, you have dollars that invest in that and financial aid's here to kind of help you manage costs to the best that we can within choosing this investment that you have in creating a better future for yourself. Um, studies that we still have, studies that we still read, uh, that I come across still show that your, your lifetime earnings are uh, increased by having a college education. And so we're still really invested in trying to do that. Um, and it takes you know, time sometimes for those payoffs to happen, but this is an investment in you. And it's a four year investment for a lifetime of earnings that kind of go along with that. So we wanna thank you really for that interest and kind of what goes in with that. So when we look at that, we're looking at different components of costs when we talk about financial aid. We're talking about tuition and fees, obviously, that's what it takes uh, for your academics to be in a classroom and do all those different things you pay for tuition and fees. Um, it also costs room and board. So the next biggest expense, or probably the bigger expense of, of that college kind of piece is, is your food and housing and your room and board. Uh, so you, you're allowed to give you financial aid to meet some of those expenses. Uh, books and supplies are a component of those expenses. You have to get books for classes. You have to get supplies for different classes, whether they're art or some other piece, uh, anything that you get along those lines, though, uh, financial aid can help you with those costs as well. And then we also have a component that's called personal expenses and transportation. So it's kind of a fill. So basically what we're saying here is financial aid can help you not just with tuition and fees, but with all the expenses that kind of go along with as a personal um, adventure in kind of pursuing higher education, you have these other expenses that go along with it. And so financial aid builds you a cost based on these different components to kind of help you be able to fund that. So it's set on a limit. And these are kind of federally defined for us, but it gives us a place to kind of go in terms of what we're looking at. So this is an example of a current year cost. So this, we don't have costs quite yet for next year yet, but you can see here kind of where that goes. We have. Direct expenses, so direct expenses are what you're gonna owe Montana State University when you register for classes, sign up for food and housing, and you get those, you have costs that are directly payable to Montana State University. Those are direct expenses. So we know those show up on your bill, depending on your situation. Other things that probably won't show up on your bill are those books and supplies and those personal miscellaneous and transportation expenses. In that though, you're still allowed to kind of get or, or capture money for those expenses because, because you still travel back and forth to campus. You still need to buy um, just, you know, regular maintenance items, like shampoo and all these other different kinds of things. So we can help financially, can help do that or help kind of mitigate some of those costs. And so you can see here, just a comparison of what a resident student pays, what a non-resident student pays, and we can give financial aid up to those costs depending where it is. Um, Flipping back a slide or two, we talked about, you know, a premier scholarship and uh, the achievement scholarship. And WUI is a scholarship, but WUI, instead of being a scholarship applied to a non-resident cost, is actually done through a tuition assessment. So you pay 150% uh, of the in-state tuition and fees. So in that, that scholarship shows up more in a tuition assessment than it does by seeing something in that. So that WUI tuition assessment, though, reflects the value of that cost in terms of what it looks like is going on with that. So uh, what we want you to kind of take away from that is you have a direct expenses directly payable to MSU, that'll be part of your student bill, but you have other costs that you're gonna get, get every week, every month in terms of your time in school, and financial aid can also help you with those costs uh, with different financial aid programs that are there. Or it's a mix and it's a balance of what you choose to do and kind of what you do with that. First thing we need to do is determine what kind of financial aid you might be eligible for and that's what takes the application. And so uh, this is an annual piece. We'll kind of get into the next one right away with that. Um, if, if you're a parent of a student now who has already been in college or been in college some time ago, um, the FAFSA the tw for 24, 25 will be different than what you've seen before. If you've never done one before, this will be a, a brand new experience for you. Uh, but the idea behind this new uh, overhaul of the FAFSA is to create a, a streamlined application, meaning it'll be easier for applicants and parents to use, and to expand some eligibility for federal financial aid. So uh, we're hoping to see out of this that the formulas behind the application itself will generate more students being eligible for the federal Pell Grant. 
and for students being eligible for more federal Pell Grant if they've gotten it before. So we'll kind of see what that looks like. And then challenges to the application have always been for uh, certain student populations. And that, that can be, you know, where you get into the FAFSA form and it starts asking you about your family and kind of where those go. Um, you, you may, students in the past have, and parents have gotten frustrated with those and then kind of walked away and seen the FAFSA as a barrier to getting completed for financial aid. So we hope the application and the redo of this is supposed to kind of eliminate some of those barriers depending on your situation and your population that you might be in. So skip logic in the form, reduce questions to answer. And part of what goes along with this is uh, obviously in the free application for federal student aid is that you have to report income information. And there's an enhanced process with this that goes along into the IRS that kind of goes, to, that streamlines that fact of getting your income information into the application. So we have an updated formula, which will kind of do that. And, and the one thing, even though the application itself is not yet open, is that you can create an account for yourself, which is called an FSA ID. You can do that now before the FAFSA even is open. And I can't encourage you strongly enough, if you don't already have one, to go get that done just as soon as possible. Uh, that can take two to three days to actually turn itself around to where you have a legitimate, uh, valid, um, confirmed FSA ID or an account with federal student aid. And in order to do that, complete that application, you will need that ID to even get it started. So we want to get that done just as quickly as we can and get that done in front of the FAFSA opening sometime in December. Um, kind of a language change here, too. Um, as a student, you will be inviting people to contribute to your application. And when we say invite, and we talk about contributors, we're generally talking about parents. Um, we can also talk about a spouse, a spouse in that situation, but generally we're talking about parents who are going to be responsible to contribute to the application. But uh, part of the features of the new FAFSA are going to be that student kind of has a pathway that they complete on their own. The student invites a parent as a contributor to provide information on that application. Uh, that may be one parent or a joint tax return. It, it might just be one parent with a joint tax return. And they will have a pathway into that application. If there's mixed uh, contributors with a, a, a initial parent and then a new uh, step parent, then that both parents, depending on when they filed or how they filed, may have another lane of providing information into that. But in spite of any one of those different lanes, there is a direct exchange with the IRS for anybody who's filed tax information. And your access to that by being a contributor and your consent to completing a FAFSA gives us access to have this relationship with the Internal Revenue Service to bring in this tax information. So by doing that, you answer a lot less questions than you've answered in the previous FAFSA form by being able to do that manually and by probably, in a lot of cases, not getting that as accurate as we would like it to have. So right now, we expect the, the application to open sometime uh, late December. Uh, information that we got as, as recently as today suggests still that they say it will be open and available by the last day in December. Um, so that's still, you know, four, six weeks out. Uh, so we need you to be kind of pay attention to communications that you get from admissions, uh, from, financial, from financial aid, uh, from anyone on campus. We have information on our webpage that just speaks to when that application will become available. Uh, but it's an overhaul. Uh, if you just kind of want to imagine, this is the first time in 40 some years that the FAFSA has been uh, kind of redone. It took an act of Congress to kind of get us there. Um, and with anything that's new, we're expecting some bumps actually when this opens and when this happens. So nothing new and overhaul of this size, this magnitude will probably come without some bumps. So we're expecting that to happen. Uh, what I want to convey to you mostly there is that we have financial aid staff that are going to be here to help you. Um, so with any questions that you have, uh, with any stumbling blocks that you encourage you get through that, we are going to be prepared to ready to, to answer and help you with those questions. And please just don't panic on any barriers or questions that you have with that, please get in touch with us. Uh, we know that that's going to be the January experience for all of us completing the FAFSA, uh, not just with Montana State, but across the country. So uh, we're here to help and we're, we're, you know, we'll be poised to kind of answer those as best we can and get you 
into that completion phase just as fast as we can get to do that. So more questions with that, but a lot of it right now is we have to kind of just wait and see, right? We got to wait until the FAFSA opens. We've got to kind of figure out what the experience the user is having, and then we'll be able to kind of navigate the best answers and the best tools to be able to kind of get you through the application itself. But know that please don't panic to know that we're here to help as an institution and we'll get you through that process. Anytime we do anything with uh, uh, on the federal level, we have process of checks and balances to kind of go through. And uh, there is a process in financial aid that's called verification. And so mostly through a random sample or sometimes based on how you answer questions, federal student aid will kick out your application to the institution and say, it's in verification. And what that means is we have to check the accuracy of the data on your application. Uh, please note that that does not mean that you did anything wrong on the application. Many of these things are random. Many of these things are just based on a profile or how you might have answered a question. And we're accountable for the federal money that we get and that we give out uh, through the federal programs. And so part of this is just a compliance at the federal level that says there is a quality control element that has to go on with this. And there is value that goes back to making sure that the right students get the right dollars at the right time. So if you get in a verification piece, don't panic. Again, uh, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just means we probably need a little extra information from you. That could be as simple as a one page, two page worksheet that you tell us a little bit more about your family or confirm your family household and do these kinds of different things. And if that's the case, we're gonna send you information and you're gonna probably send you uh, an email and it's gonna tell you to go into your MyInfo and your MyInfo is gonna tell you to go to our forms page and you're gonna see it on there. Uh, if you go to the forms page, I don't have an example of that there, but that will have a verification section for 2024-25 and it will have a list of forms available and you're gonna click on one of those, fill it out and give it back to us. And then we're gonna be able to kind of finish up your application with that. But what we want you to do is stay open to communication. Look for emails or communications from us that direct you into action items that might be needed. And ultimately what we're trying to do is get you uh, an award. Uh, what you can see on the right side here is just a kind of a copy of our main page. And it's got the FAFSA update information here that we have. So traditionally, you know, it's, it's pointing you that this opens generally on October 1st, 23rd. Uh, FAFSA generally opens on October 1st. Uh, it's not this year, but it should next year again. So uh, what I haven't said yet is the FAFSA is an annual application. So for 25, 26, we're expecting that application to open again on October 1st. So that turnaround and that repetition of that should begin somewhat there. But this current FAFSA will determine your eligibility for fall, spring, and summer terms of, of this coming academic year. So uh, you can check our, our updates for there also on our main page. Just know that that's there. Um, we'll update that as soon as we know more about what's going on. Plus, we'll be sending out communications uh, probably with admissions help to get to you so that you know that what that looks like. So know that that's there. Know that there could be some extra steps that needed to get there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get you awarded with a financial aid package. Um, and that financial aid package is a, is a combination of the best kinds of things that we can get for you. Scholarships and grants are free money. They're gift aid. They don't have to be repaid. Work study is you work for some funds and get those done um, through uh, money really in your pocket for those uh, indirect expenses because you're working a job on campus and you get paid um, every two weeks for a work study position. But that just puts money in your pocket. But those funds for work study, when we call that, come from either federal or state programs that subsidize your employment on campus for an employer. So, for example, if a work study benefits financial aid office because rather than paying you 100% of the wages out of my budget, I can pay you 30% of the wage and the work study program picks up 70% of your wages. Uh, that means I can hire three students instead of one. And so that creates opportunities all across campus for that to use. If you're interested in work study for 2024-25, uh, you're going to have to, we need you to come see us and kind of be on the lookout for that. We won't know that. You can find a job, and if they have work study, you can come see us. Uh, it's need-based, and uh, we won't be able to kind of award that up front because we won't know what the jobs are and what you're going to have and kind of see that. So it'll be a little bit different. But if you're interested in that, we want you to come see us, and we can talk about what that looks like. And the last thing we loan, but it is still considered financial aid, are student loans. And those are, are student loans both for the student themselves and for the potentially for the parent if they want to subsidize some of those costs 
with what we call a parent loan. So you'll see hopefully different types of awards on there, but those are the different categories of financial aid that you might see. Uh, important dates going uh, forward. So the CAT scholarship application is something uh, that opens on November 1st of every year with a, a February uh, priority date. So kind of look for that, it's open now. Um, CAT scholarships generally are for continuing students, but you're gonna hear often uh, Keith and I telling you that you can't win if you don't play kind of mantra. And that's if you don't fill out the FAFSA, we can't put you in a position to at least know what's there or not there. And if you don't complete CAT scholarships, you won't be put in a pool to even be considered for awards. So those are two things that we need you to do annually, just because it puts you in the best position and it gives you the best kind of information so that you can make the most informed decision that you can with the expenses and with the financial aid package that you have. Um, the presidential scholarship application, that's December 1st. Um, December here, we still don't have the date, but the FAFSA opens for 24-25. Uh, January 3rd is the WUI application deadline. Uh, February 1st is that uh, preferred filing date. So preferred is the, is the key element there. Just because you may not do the FAFSA by February 1st doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's just the preferred filing date to maximize opportunities and availability that's there because funding goes out early. And so some of those funding, if it dries up early, you won't be able to get into it. But that doesn't exclude you. The, the FAFSA form always applies you for the Pell Grant and for federal student loans, no matter when you fill it out. So that can still be done. And February 1st is also the preferred filing date for the CAT scholarships. And then wrapping that out, we have October 1st already for 2024 is when that 25-26 FAFSA becomes available. So you're looking for that award package from us. That should come out in March, we hope, uh, with the delays that we're experiencing this year. That could push us back a little bit, but you want to stay tuned to being a early March kind of on the lookout for a, a financial aid offer that you've done the FAFSA, we've looked at it, and here's kind of what the packages that we can give you, uh, whether your eligibility for the federal program exists and what kind of federal student loans we might be able to give for you in that regard. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Keith and give us a chance just to switch mics here and then you can have it. <clears throat> Thank you, James. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being proactive. Uh, my name is Keith Hamburg. Um, I serve as the senior financial coach in the Office of Financial Education. And one of the things Anders told you at the beginning is even though I am not the financial aid office, we work uh, in concert with financial aid all the time. We present together um, at our scholarships, we present during orientation, and, and we're often working together for the betterment of the students. So my office is located in the basement of the sub. We're part of the Alan Yarnell Center for Student Success, which you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen in about Eight feet away from that is the Office of Financial Education right next to the bowling alley in the basement of the sub. And, um, you know, I'm not gonna read verbatim, but these are just some logos of what we do, uh, whether it's a clinic or whether we're talking to students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we'll talk to you about anything from salary negotiations to scholarship, uh, uh, looking for scholarships. Um, and, and honestly, um, one of the uh, most important roles that we play is one-on-one -on -one financial coaching. Because I say this anytime I present to a group, uh, and that is that finances are an individual sport. Um, no two people in my 11 years here uh, are in the same boat. Some get Pell Grant, some don't get Pell Grant, in-state, out-of-state, WUI, achievement award. So we're here to help you, we're here to help the parents, um, uh, and we'll have lots of uh, upcoming uh, clinics to help you do that later this spring. And uh, that brings you into uh, kind of what I've already said, and that is one-on-one uh, -on -one and small group coaching, clinics, events, classrooms. Uh, we also have a team right now. We have three peer mentors, students in MSU, that mentor other students and help other students uh, as they call into our office uh, or walk in to our office. Um, a, a little, uh, uh, these next couple slides is, is very much a repetition to what James uh, has already talked to you about. Um, one of the things, uh, if you decide uh, that MSU uh, is the school for you, is be on the lookout for something called paying for school for incoming freshmen in, and their families. We do uh, about a dozen workshops from April all the way through July to help you 
because um, by then we know FAST will be open. We know that uh, you'll have an award, you'll have a scholarship, and we can help you um, uh, determine how you're going to uh, pay for school and, and look for any uh, outside funding uh, if still possible. Being that we're uh, in mid-November, it's a great week to be a Bobcat. It's Cat Grizz week, so um, this is a perfect time. This is scholarship season. Um, uh, and, and then you'll notice something on here that's very premature if you're going to be a freshman in the fall of 2024, and that is that uh, we want to make sure that you've gone through all the processes of financial aid, from applying for it to accepting it. Um, if you're taking student loans, doing something called entrance counseling and signing a master promissory note, just to make sure that by the time you get to school, uh, you have all those things um, in order. And again, a little repetition to what James just talked about, but I honestly cannot uh, overstate this. And, and as James said, uh, you know, you can't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket and you can't get a uh, scholarship internally from MSU through the colleges if you don't do CAT scholarship. For those in a wooey state, um, James and his team uh, so gracefully made it that you had to do CAT scholarship. So that way, uh, a student who's applied for wooey has done the CAT scholarship application. So even if there um, aren't a uh, necessarily a ton of, of, of freshman awards in CAT scholarship. Um, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in the College of uh, Engineering, the College of Business. So this is uh, on the left-hand side of the screen uh, is the actual uh, picture of CAT scholarship. If you've been accepted to Montana State um, and uh, you have a net ID and password, you can apply uh, for CAT scholarship. Uh, as James mentioned, it opened November 1st, priority deadline. I like to call it the deadline, but it's, it is the priority deadline. It's still open. But for uh, a lot of our colleges, you want to beat that deadline. So um, uh, definitely something you're, you're going to want to do. And as James mentioned with FAFSA, each year you'll apply for FAFSA. Each year you'll apply for CAT scholarship. Um, this is for those out in WebEx land uh, who are in the state of Montana. Uh, James mentioned this earlier. We have a program called the Hilleman Scholars Program. You have to be an in-state student. Uh, you can see on the screen, it's about uh, a leadership uh, program uh, designed specifically for Montana future leaders. You can see on the screen, it talks about what happens year one, year two, year three. Um, and uh, Montana residents uh, who graduate from high school in 2024 and are eligible for Pell Grant are invited to apply by a letter from the president of Montana State University. If you don't receive that letter, it doesn't mean that you can't apply. It's a, it's a fantastic program, can, comes with lots of wraparound services, and uh, it's a very significant uh, scholarship uh, on top of that. This is just a, a quick slide just to show you uh, those in Montana or those who've been to Montana, uh, where some of our students come from, uh, every corner of Montana, uh, from the uh, northeast uh, up towards Canada, uh, towards the northwest up in the uh, Kalispell, Whitefish area, uh, all the way down towards uh, southeastern Montana. Uh, this is where our Hilleman Scholars come from. We are in year eight of that program, um, and uh, we're always excited to uh, welcome our Hillemans uh, to campus. So with that, uh, I think Anders will probably unmic and James and I can share the microphone. Uh, so Anders, I think this is at a point where we can um, maybe open it up uh, for questions. I know that uh, Ashley from Financial Aid and the admissions team has been typing away uh, for questions. But uh, yeah, Anders, if you want to take over, we can uh, answer any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you both so much for, for taking this time to walk through what is at this point sort of a difficult topic. Um, there, there's still a lot of question marks having to do with the new FAFSA process and the new procedures. And so um, just being able to spend some time with our prospective students and families to kind of go through some of the basics and the things that we do know, I, I think is really, really good. So um, for, for those of you who are still logged in, uh, keep adding those questions, keep, whether it's through the Q&A or the chat feature, keep throwing those in and our staff are, is still gonna do their best to help answer everything that we can for you all. Uh, but for Keith and James, um, we did kind of like handpick or I, I've just been taking note of several questions that came up throughout that were a little bit thematic. Um, one thing that came up several times, it came up in both the Q&A and in the chat, is there a general like ballpark number. I know that that paying for school is an individual sport, exactly like you just said, Keith. 
but is there a general number in regards to a medium household income that is that is required or necessary to receive federal aid in the forms of grants and loans? Um, good question, Anders. The question comes up a lot, and I, I'll, I'll caveat some of this by saying, you know, the feds keep the formula fairly secret, and that for good proprietary reason, I, I imagine so. But there are poverty tables that are used nationally, and based on income and the number of people in your household and, and those different variables, you fall into different ranges of what that eligibility should look like. So by by going now into these poverty tables a little differently than they have in the past, it's a little bit more consistent in terms of what they're, but it would be really difficult to say that without, is there one parent, two parent, uh, how many kids in the household, how many, those kinds of elements to say what that median income is. Uh, what we can say is that regardless of that income level, regardless of what that looks like, you'll be offered some sort of student loan package. And that is the, that educational choice that you'll have to make on, uh, do I need all of it? Do I need part of it? Uh, how can I help it or use those loans to help me kind of get through uh, some of those direct or indirect costs? So, but those loans are available either way, regardless of that income level. Gotcha. Okay, cool. That helps. Um, let's see a another question. This is actually a question that we handpicked from the registration forms. Um, can you all talk a little bit about what scholarship and or tuition waiver opportunities are available for American Indian students, whether they're from Montana or not? Uh, the fee waiver or the tribal homelands a little bit. Yeah, so, uh. Potential for, for either, whether you're in state or out of state. So in state, uh, you have the American Indian uh, waiver, which is through the state system. Uh, so when we talked about the MUS before, MUS kind of provides that waiver uh, for us as institutions. And there is a blood quantum percentage that you have to meet, as well as just a, a, a element of financial need. And so financial aid will collect that blood quantum from you and then evaluate your financial need. Um, but you can do that through the financial aid office by applying for that. And then as a non-resident, there is a tribal homeland feature. It's a little bit different, um, but you have information for that on our website. I think the best thing to do would be to look for tribal homeland on our webpage, kind of get the criteria down for that and determine whether that's a possibility for you or not. But both are used pretty frequently here at Montana State. Okay, cool. Um, and for one of our uh, staff teammates that, that we have on, um, if one of you wouldn't mind diving in and throwing that link into the chat or the Q&A feature, that would be wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, this question came up a lot uh, during, the, during the session this evening. Can you talk about the process of applying for FAFSA in a divided household, uh, whether that's through divorce or separation? Um, who needs to fill out the FAFSA? Who needs their FSA ID? Um, how does that happen when one household makes more than another household? Can you just kind of talk a little bit about that puzzle? Yeah, it, it's it's a, one of the major changes kind of that are happening with the FAFSA for 24, 25. Um, part of that is going to be based on how long that household may have changed or may not may not have changed, but. Uh, one of the enhancements that they're talking about within the application itself is called a parent wizard. So the student will be going through the FAFSA and they will get to a certain section when they talk about the contributors and they're going to answer some questions about the marital status of their parents. And, and the biggest confusion that generally happens with that is uh, there is a predominant parent who provides most of that support and that's graciously kind of triggered off of the IRS filing. If that student has been a dependent on your taxes, you can kind of consider that student to belong to that parent as being the one who provides most of that support. Uh, that makes them part of that household. Um, but in comparison of that, if we get really nitpicky about that, it's whoever provides the most support for that child or will be providing the most support for that child during that academic cycle. And that's going to be up to the parents to kind of make that determination down to the penny if that's what they have to do. But one one of those parents has to decide where they go with that decision and where that goes. Now, uh, remarried parents is a common question, uh, but if a parent is remarried and they're that primary guardian, though, as, as the um, biological parent, then it is likely that that step parent or that joint income will be used in the FAFSA process. 
Um, but what we're hoping for is this, that this parent wizard that we see in the FAFSA tool will help define that really more specifically for the student as they're walking through. It used to not define that for them until after they completed the FAFSA. This hopefully is kind of an in-front vehicle that gets you to that before you actually invite the appropriate people to contribute to the application. So um, other than that, if any kind of question on that as you're going through that, that's when we need you to call. We, we answer those questions on and how kind of help you with those all the time. Cool, right on, thank you. Um, okay, these are, this is actually a mixture of questions that came in this evening and on the registration forms. And you mentioned this earlier, James. Um, and when we met yesterday uh, between you and Keith and I, we, Keith, I think posed a question about this. Um, can you talk about the differences with work study again? Um, for, for those of you out there, work study is an on-campus employment program uh, that provides students an opportunity to work, earn money, help pay for school. But that process is changing pretty significantly this year. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that, James? Yeah, so again, just to kind of recap work study and shell. So we get funds from both the federal uh, student aid and from Montana uh, that, that are designated for work study funds. And um, while as a, as a student himself looking for a job, you may not see the value in that, but the value is within the number of opportunities that Montana State gets to open up because we have these work study programs. So it means that there are more jobs available throughout campus because it, and employers like financial aid or financial education could hire multiple students and still pay them with the money that they have to be able to facilitate that. So the work study jobs uh, with the work study funds, a student pay after they've worked hours is paid 70% from the federal or the state work study program and 30% by the institution. Uh, what's missing on the FAFSA in this new remodel is that there used to be a question on the FAFSA that asked you whether you were interested in work study or not. And we would use that question to award you as freshmen uh, a work study or program or not based on how you answered that question. Well, that question disappeared. So now with a little bit more of that uh, effort there is if you're a student and you're interested in work, one, we can come by and check with us and see if you're eligible anytime. Two, you just look for the job across campus and you talk to that employer and you find out from that employer whether that job is work study eligible or not. And if it is, then we then you come back to us and we have an agreement then with the employer, the student and us to facilitate getting the student into the work study program and doing that there. So um, if you're interested in working is the primary key there, please know that that's a possibility and that we, you know, we're looking to use that as best that we can um, in whatever eligibility kind of range we have. We're working, you know, with our uh, food and housing, because uh, they're a big employer on campus, our student health and rec center are another big employer on campus, and we're working closely with them to try to facilitate to students who are working who may not have, have known that they were eligible to make them or review them and make them eligible for work study too. Cool. And for those of you out there joining us, um, you'll find and you'll hear people on our campus talk about it. There's all sorts of historical studies that have been done that there are, are direct benefits to a student working while they're while they're in college. And that's just not at Montana State University, that's everywhere. So um, whether it's a work study program or a, just a standard student employment opportunity, we really do encourage to, if you're comfortable doing so and get engaged in, in employment on campus to, to get the most out of the college experience. So. Um, hey, Anders, I yes, want, I, I've seen a couple of things through the chat and Ashley uh, may have answered this. But I saw a number of parents say, if I had an FSAD for my other kid, do I need to create a new one? I just thought James should maybe uh, touch on that real quick. Cool. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, it, once you have an FSAID, you have one for any application that you might need to contribute to. So if there are multiple children going to colleges, either at the same place or different places, that single FSAID will get you into that one track. So parents on time, students one time one FSA ID, don't lose track of it. We, we, the, the biggest struggle we have with the FAFSA on many occasions is people forget or don't remember their credentials that they used to kind of create that FSA ID. And it's kind of like anything else when you have an app now, you got to know your username, got to know a password to get in. 
and it becomes your electronic signature, right? This is how you're giving consent, and this is how you're signing the forms, not just the FAFSA. You, this is your account with federal student aid. So if you do take loans or do any other kind of activity, this FSA ID is your signature and your pathway into completing entrance counseling, master promissory note, number of different things. It's where your history of loans, anything that you have for that, will all be located in your profile from here on out once you once you build an account. Okay. Nice. Cool. Um, Keith, this one is a little bit more, I, I believe, up your alley, but kind of kind of both offices, and it has to do with the previous subject that we were just talking about. Uh, Keith, do you want to talk about what you sort of how you approach conversations with students when it comes to they're receiving financial assistance. Uh, maybe they need to work on campus. Maybe they need to set up a, a tuition payment plan. Can you kind of talk about what what all goes into a student budgeting properly through various means of of income while they're a student? Absolutely. And and one of the things uh, my coworker uh, produced was. Uh, a budget sheet just for paying for school. We know that you might have to budget uh, after you move off campus for rent and monthly bills and and, and semi adult expenses, if you will. Uh, but yeah, we have processes and we work with you again, whether it's in uh, a, a workshop setting, whether it's in a group setting or whether it's in an individual setting, uh, as James mentioned with financial aid, working with the work study, especially with this change of the question not being there, our office uh, uh, has a website called hireabobcat.com. Um, is every on-campus job listed there? No, uh, we list the jobs of people who uh, market their jobs on the website, but that's also a great first start. So is stopping by, uh, as James mentioned, uh, financial aid to see if you qualify for work study. Even, and I hate to go backwards, I know we need to move forward, but even some students who may have not checked that box in previous FAFSAs, uh, they're like, oh, I don't get work study. It's like, go visit with financial aid and they'll tell you whether you go on a wait list or, or if they have the funds to help you. It's one of those things, if you don't ask, you don't get. So, uh, Anders, we, we try to, uh, again, uh, have a wraparound service to uh, everything from how do we pay for school? How do we take on as little loans as possible? Uh, and how do we get as much scholarship as possible? And that's why we uh, you know, both you, you heard both James and I not only talk about your incoming scholarships, like an achievement award, or if you're an in-state student, a premier scholarship, but what about outside scholarships? And we work very closely uh, with Chris Williams and James's office uh, to, to find those scholarships. And uh, again, I know this is an example for now, uh, but but the financial aid office uh, during the Can the Grizz, um, our uh, benefit to uh, try to uh, raise uh, food and money for uh, the local food bank here in Bozeman. They do the same thing in Missoula. James's offers. Uh, James's office offers bring a can of food and get into a raffle for a five hundred dollars scholarship. And again, you can't get the scholarship if you don't bring a can of food. And it's not that hard to bring a can of beans over and and put your name in for a five hundred dollars scholarship. So hopefully, I answered the question, Anders. If there's anything specific, uh, please let me know. No, I think that was awesome. I, I, I appreciate that that overview and that insight. Um, okay, we've got time for just a couple of more questions. And, and for those of you who have stayed log, logged on, thank you so much. Um, Keith, I've heard you talk about this exact thing before. Um, what forms of payment does MSU take? Can we pay in person with cash? Can you yeah. pay by credit card? And if so, is there any fees for that at Montana State? A great question, and, and you kind of asked it before and I didn't answer it, but Again, thinking forward towards orientation, uh, James's office, uh, the student accounts office, Joe Young, uh, and myself, we come together and talk to you about those things. MSU uh, is unique in, in some ways. I'm sure there are other universities that do it, but no matter how you pay us, whether it's cash, check, e-check, debit card, or credit card, Montana State University does not charge you a fee uh, for that. Montana State University also offers a tuition payment plan. It basically takes what we, uh, I stole this from our friends at financial aid, but how you fill the gap. So if your scholarship and your FAFSA equal X and there's a gap of $4,000, how are you going to fill that gap? One of the offers is a tuition payment plan. There's a $30 uh, setup fee. The university does not charge you interest 
on that payment plan and you can take what you owe, divide it by four. I break it down into semesters, Anders, from a standpoint of in the fall, you'll have a payment depending on when you come to orientation, either in early August or towards the end of August, another payment October 1st, November 1st and December 1st. And then of course, in the spring semester, it's a January, February, March and April payment. But yes, MSU does not charge no matter what form of payment you use. We're getting a little bit more uh, uh, electronic with 529 college savings plans. Some of those can be done electronically, uh, but Joe and student accounts will let you know how those funds are sent. And uh, uh, kind of uh, stepping on James's toes here a little bit, but I would also tell you all out there that as you get outside scholarships, you want to report those to James's office. There's a wonderful, uh, uh, easy to use form on their website called the scholarship reporting form. You get a $750 scholarship from your local Kiwanis club, and you're going to use that to help pay. You report it to MSU. That way they know the money is coming and uh, it works out best for everyone. Did I say that good enough, James? Yeah, I, I agree, Keith. And oftentimes these um, checks can be made out to Montana State University. You're going to have to bring them in anyway. The earlier we know about them, the better. Uh, sometimes they're made out um, to both the Montana State and to the student, at which point the student will need to sign it, bring it in, and we'll turn it over and then get it processed. So, but uh, yeah, we get thousands of outside checks. So getting them early and as quickly as possible is great. Okay, cool. Um... So folks, we are at the very top of the hour. And so I, I wanna say again, as I've said all evening tonight, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you so much for logging in. And uh, Keith and James, thanks, thank you both for taking the time out of your schedules to come and relay this information for our, for our families. Um, for the folks that are online with us this evening, we do wanna keep in touch with you however we can as often as possible. And so up on the screen right now is the Office of Admissions contact information. Please let us know what we can do to help you out. This is a really uh, windy process and there's a million different routes through it. And so as questions come up, we're always happy to help get you in touch with somebody from James's office or Keith's office, or if there's things that we can help you out with along the way as well. Um, just let us know how we can help with us or email or phone call and we'll always be there to go to bat for you. So. Again, thank you all so much for your time this evening. Get a, get a hold of us if you need. And um, I hope that this was informative. I hope that this helped everybody kind of answer some of their questions. And so as uh, Keith has mentioned several times throughout the, the evening, this is a big week for us here at Montana State University. So uh, go Cats. We'll see you on our next webinars coming up in the spring. And we'll keep in touch with you until then. Take care. Bye-bye.